Hello, my name is Eugenia Bogdanova Kumar. I'm assistant professor in Japanese arts at the Sainsbury Institute for the Study of Japanese Arts and Cultures, which is affiliated with the University of East Anglia. And I would like to present my new book uh, called Boku Jinkai, Japanese Calligraphy and the Bosmo Avant-Garde, which will be published by Braille in the Japanese Visual Culture Series in September 2020. So this is a bit less than in two months time, and I'm very excited to finally see it in print. In this book, I'm looking at the modern calligraphy history from Japan and investigate how Japanese calligraphers interacted and collaborated with abstract artists of European art and formal and American abstract expressionists in the 1950s and 60s. The overall aim of my study is to reintegrate calligraphy into the modern historiography of post-war art. And I would like to start by looking at these two exhibitions which were on display at the same time in New York in summer of 1954. The one on the left is, was called Young American Painters as Selection at the Guggenheim Museum, and it included works by Franz Klein, Robert Motherwell, Jackson Pollock, William de Kooning, and more. And the show on the right was called Japanese Calligraphy, and it was on display in MoMA at the same time, and it included works by Ueda Sokyu, Eguchi Sogen, Enoa Yuuchi, Nakamura Bokushi, and more. As you probably notice, many of you would be familiar with the names from the Guggenheim show, while not so many would have heard names from the Japanese calligraphy exhibition. Even though critics in New York at that time have pointed out that the most remarkable about these two exhibitions was the strength of the mutual affinities between these two groups of artists. Critics even suggested that it would be possible to exchange some works between these two shows without drastically changing the mood of the either show. Now, in my book, I'm asking why is it the case that this interaction between Japanese avant-garde calligraphy and Euro-American abstract painting seems surprising today? What did calligraphers contribute to the global trends in abstract painting in the early post-war years? And what can we learn about historiography of global post-war abstraction if we consider their contribution? These two works by two artists from uh, these two shows in uh, New York in 54 are a very good example of visual and theoretical exchange between calligraphy and abstract painting in the 1950s. The one on the left is abstract painting by Franz Klein called October Day, and the one on the right is uh, calligraphy by Inoue Yuichi called Work A. And I would like to point out here that during 1955 and 56, Inoue Yuichi is uh, working in complete abstraction, so he's not using characters in his calligraphers. And in fact, it's indeed hard to tell which of these two works is calligraphy and which one is painting. The two artists knew of each other, they exchanged letters, and Klein was receiving calligraphic journals from Japan and distributing them among his friends in New York. And so they clearly were looking at each other's work. So my question is not only what did Klein learn by looking at modern Japanese calligraphy, but also how did calligraphers use insights from abstract painting to modernize their art and to make it more accessible to wider audiences, including international audiences. And in fact, they learned a lot. Starting from the end of the Second World War, Japanese calligraphy was experiencing an unprecedented wave of innovation and modernization. New generation of avant-garde calligraphers challenged every aspect of their art and its conventions. They experimented with materials. And here uh, in the work on the left by Hidai Nankoku, you can see how the artist uses oil on canvas for his calligraphy instead of conventional ink on paper. And on the right, you can see how Osawa Gaku chose to reference um, French avant-garde poetry by surrealist poet Louis Aragon in his calligraphy instead of using more conventional and more traditional Chinese classics. The group that fueled and inspired these radical experimentations and who were the driving force behind calligraphy's post-war internationalization was called the Boku Jinkai, or People of the Ink. 
which is also the title of my book. This group was formed in Kyoto in 1952 and included five young artists, Morita Shiryu, Inoue Yuuchi, Eguchi Sogen, Nakamura Bokushi, and Sekiya Yoshimichi. Their vision was to bring Japanese calligraphy to the same level of international prominence, prominence as Euro-American abstract painting. And I must say that for a short period of time, they were extremely close to their goal. The Boko Jinkai's international vision can be visualized in this work and in the concept behind it. This is calligraphy by one of the Boko Jinkai's founding members, Morita Shiryu, and it shows a character Niji, or Rainbow. For Morita, rainbow was a symbol of the collaboration between East Asian calligraphy and Euro-American painting. As he explained, rainbow stands with one leg in the East, in uh, Japanese and East Asian calligraphy, and with other, the other leg in the West, in Euro-American painting. Yet these two foundations can join together in height to form a beautiful rainbow, a future universal art form that would transcend all borders and limitations. So that was the Boko Jinkai's vision for the future of modern art globally. In the core three chapters of my book, I explore how Morita and Boko Jinkai realized this vision in practice and which strategies they employed. The first strategy was based on the visual dialogue between calligraphy and abstract painting. Here we see the works by Pierre Soulage, abstract painter, of Berwick School on the left and calligraphy by Morita Shiryu on the right. Same as client, Pierre Soulage was very well aware of the recent developments in Japan, in Japanese calligraphy, and he was even going to Japan to participate in roundtable discussions with the Boku Jinkai artists. Uh, he was contributing his works and writings to their journal and was exhibiting together with them. Uh, in particular, in this chapter, I'm looking at the concepts of line and space across calligraphy and abstract painting. And on example of these two works, we can see how um, at this point, Morita Shiryu starts exploring the concept of negative space, both visually and conceptually for his calligraphy, and how that relates to what is happening at the same time in Europe and in the United States. In the next chapter, I explore the postwar primitivism and the ways how it was adopted and used in Japanese calligraphy and in Euro-American abstract painting. On the left is a work by Inoue Yuichi, it's a calligraphy again, and on the right is painting by Juan de Ro. In his calligraphy, Inoue Yuichi is using oracle bond script and a reference to an early Chinese Taoist text, while visually clearly referencing works by Juan Miro and establishing a dialogue between Sino-Japanese archaist calligraphy tradition and more modern European primitivist painting. And finally, the third strategy that the Boku Jinkai employed to enter the global art scene was embracing the post-war Zen boom. As you know, the early post-war years saw a great interest in Japanese Buddhist tradition and philosophy and visual culture, first in the United States and then in Europe. This image is a photography or a installation view of an exhibition of Japanese calligraphy, of avant-garde Japanese calligraphy in Paris in 56 in Museum Chernovsky. And what is interesting about this image is the perspective that the photographer chose for his, for his, uh, uh, for his work. Uh, if you look carefully, you can notice that he is placing the camera behind the shoulder of the Buddha statue which is situated in the same room. So if you look carefully here on the left, you can see a hand of a Buddha in mudra, which is floating over the exhibition space and over the works of Japanese calligraphers. It is quite representative for the ways how foreign audiences wanted to see calligraphy at this point, namely as an integral part of Japanese Buddhist tradition. And in my book, I discuss how the Boko Jinkai calligraphers employed and used this interest. So this was a very short taster for some of the issues that I discuss in my book. With my study, I wanted to show that the Boko Jinkai calligraphers rerouted the trajectories of global abstract art and attuned foreign audiences to, to calligraphic visualities and narratives. I argue 
that the names of the Boku Jinkai artists need to be reinscribed in the history of art next to those artists of American abstract expressionism and European art and female with whom they once exhibited and collaborated. Thank you very much for your attention. If you're interested in this book, I hope you will get a chance to read it very, very soon. Thank you very much and please take care.